Welcome to the On-Premise IT Roundtable Podcast. I'm Stephen Foskett, your host from Gestalt IT. We are here on-premises at the SolarWinds Studios with some great folks. Um, why don't I have you guys introduce yourselves to start off with? Yep. Hi, I'm Luigi Danikos, and you can find me at Twitter at NerdBlurt. Hi, I'm Leona Dotto. You can find me at Leona Dotto on Twitter. I'm Sonia Cuff, and I'm on Twitter at Cuff underscore S. And I'm Patrick Hubbard. You can find me at Fervent Geek on Twitter. So today we're looking at um, alerts and monitoring. And frankly, your alerts and uh, my alerts And so do all of our alerts. Well, maybe not some of us who are experts in the field. But I'll tell you, I am tired of getting stuff. It, uh, it goes nowhere. I don't even read it anymore. I just delete it and move on with it. So, uh, Leon, tell us a little bit about uh, the premise that you came up with for this podcast. Uh, I would say that if you have developed an Outlook rule to handle your incoming alert email, you have already lost the battle and the war. It's over. Um, it, and there's no reason for it. It is not alerts stink. It is your alerts stink if they're doing that to you. But if most people's alerts are like that, then can't we just say alerts stink? No, we can see that, like many things, people need to learn to get better about things, whether that's baking or bowling or setting up alerts. So, okay. How can they get better? Well, I was going to say, I would, I would disagree. I'd say many alerts stink. I mean, it's little things that are inherent to the alert, like alerts have a half-life, right? So they exponentially degrade in quality as time moves on. If they, not only if, if you just have a few, but you're not there to receive them, or they're not distributed on the team, or they're not triaged the right way, they also lose a lot of their value because they're no longer actionable. I mean, they're not, they are, they are not a metric envelope, to, to persist them and then go find look at them two weeks later. They, they have a half-life. Right, and I'll just say the emphasis is they're not actionable. That's the key. So, Sonia, you work with a lot of um, IT companies, um, sm- well, not IT companies, a lot of small companies that don't ha- really have much IT. That's right. Well, the problem is the systems that are generating all this noise. And so no matter what alert system you put in, you have to start fine-tuning what it's going to ping on and and what it doesn't. But that's just a filter over top of what the operating system or the underlying system is is warning us about. And out of the box, you go into any event log and you'll find noise in there. And so, you know, we've got an underlying problem with the the quality of the data. And as you said, we can't split out what's actually still valid. So, Luigi, you've been doing this for a long time. Um, You know, how would you do that? How could you possibly configure a system to send only the good stuff? I would look at the high priority stuff and saying, what what is the stuff that I have to action on? And then those are the only alerts that I want to see. I don't care about other people's actions. Right, which uh, comes down to a a big rule. That recipe on the back of the, you know, soup mix box, that's not actually a recipe. It's a general suggestion. No one thinks, oh, I'm going to cook that. Same thing with alerts that come out of the box from any vendor. They're suggestions or they're demonstrations of how to do a technique. They're not best practices. Don't turn those on. Yeah, but some people end up being lazy and they're just like, I'm going to turn this on and I'm going to add you to this mailing list and everyone's getting flooded. Next thing you know, you have a thousand emails in your inbox. Right, which, which were never valid because, again, it was the vendor saying, you could do some kind of action like this now build off of that sort of a accumulated failure of best intentions right because you start off thinking this this one team needs this this one event it's going to be fine so you start sending it to them and they're excited initially they think hey, this is great i can be proactive i can be self-serve and then pretty soon you start sending them a few more and then you base it on like an ad group or something else and now all of a sudden they get 100 and then they've got the rule and then they've got their fingers in their ears and they're not listening to you anymore so how can we take the newer emerging technologies that we've got and apply it to do some of this stuff? I mean, we talk about things like artificial intelligence and machine learning. I want to see a machine learning engine that I can plug into my alerting system that will start to recognize what is noise and what is valid and automatically do that filtering for me. I think it comes down to the same thing that we have. Been, I've been telling people for a while, which is if it's not actionable, don't make an alert. It can be a report. It can be a little pop-up. It can be anything, but it's not an alert. An alert has to have a human response to it. If you can automate it so that you don't need a human response, fantastic. That's an alert action. But when we're talking about alerts, we're talking about tickets, emails, things like that. And if a human can't do something about it, don't give it to a human. And you can do that with AI also. Can the AI figure out what the appropriate response is? Great. Leverage that technology to do that and leave the human asleep at 2 o'clock in the morning. Well, but there's a thing about that, too. I think we tend to think of alerting as something that comes mostly out of polling. 
But if you pull that back up and you actually think about observability, uh -huh. you think about including logs as a, as a big source of events, then you can get into things like anomaly detection because then part of that logging framework is you're actually watching when would I expect to be getting an event or even a log of an alert that pops up and now it's suddenly missing or are the rate has increased two or three times. That might actually be something that's alertable, sort of the change in behavior rather than just hitting a threshold that you uh, manually configured. Yeah, if all of a sudden you're just getting more emails sent to you, you're like, wait a second, what's going on? And it kind of causes you to look at something. Right, and it also speaks to uh, you know things that we're getting at in you know in a lot of different forms about the unknown unknowns being the really exciting alertable things. You know, I've never seen this before at all. Used to be the so ignore it. Now it's like I've never seen this before. Jump on it. That's that's interesting. The known unknowns are the ones that are considered like basic blocking and tackling now. Still important, but basic. You, you, everyone keeps saying email. Do you think that's a big part of the reason why uh, alerts suck? Is that they um, really, uh, if you only send email, if you don't, if it can't go to a mobile device, if it can't uh, pop up in an aggregated uh, view, if it doesn't come up through some other channel or hit an automated link, that we still have a tendency to go to uh, email first, maybe because that's sort of what most of the out of the box. Yeah, I would say, yeah. Email is probably the first line for an email, for an alert for me would be I get an email sent to me. Even with my alarm system, I get an email. Wasn't that then I get funny? a text message, and I get also a notification from the alarm.com app and stuff. That, but my first thing I get is an email. Isn't it funny that, um, in a way, if we're saying that your alerts stink, what we're really saying, well, if your alerts stink and your alerts are email, by the transitive property, your alerts are spam. And so really the problem is the same as the spam problem. And you just get overwhelmed by it and you end up filtering the mailbox or not reading it or deleting it. I mean, I can't tell you how many emails and alerts I get that I'm just deleting. Um, so how do we deal with alerts? Can we deal with them in the same way we deal with spam? Well, the thing that concerns me about that is the mechanism now of moving everything to Slack. And so a lot of people turn around and go, I get to end too many emails, we're going to run up a Slack team and now all of my alerts are going to go through a bot and, and ping up in Slack. We're just moving the problem. And I hate people using collaboration tools thinking that it's going to be the solution when we're just moving the noise. Right. And, and mm. I think that the, the issue with email or Slack or any of those is you're missing the wonderful part about any monitoring and automation solution is the reversal. That I'm monitoring something, something goes wrong. Whether it's an observability thing of I've never seen this before or whatever, but what happens when that condition goes away? If you have a ticketing system or some other automation system that can record it was bad, sorry, it was bad, and now it's better, that doesn't mean that a human shouldn't get involved to look at it, but they don't have to get involved to look at it right now. And email doesn't have that capability, or it does. You with another email. email. With another email, exactly. <laughs> so you know, you want to think about how do I make whatever system I'm building based on whatever software I'm using so that I can get the condition, I can see the status, I can get a reversal so I don't have to get up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, but that exactly follows the, the spam model, right? Which is giving us a chance to opt in to whether we want to receive it or not. Like that one where you, you go to click unsubscribe and it says, well, do you really want to unsubscribe or do you want once a week or once a month? So instead, being able to sort of channelize alerts so that you have some way where there's a browsable catalog of the types of alerts that normally, that's why we go to Slack, right? Because we're effectively channelizing what those message channels would be. But like giving your end users an ability to opt in and out as needed. Maybe there's a day that they want 100 alerts a day. It's a development team. They're working on process. And each one of those alerts actually is something they need to do something about. It's like coming out of a failed build or a UI test that didn't work. But then they want to be able to hop back out again. So just like you would with email, if you can actually channelize it and make that self-service, then it makes it easier for to, to, to give them the richness of lots of monitoring alerts when they want it and cut back to nothing if they don't. And that's an interesting gap in the way that our alerting systems can be configured because we talk about being able to snooze alerts when we've got a maintenance window because we don't want all that noise. The systems are down. We know they're down. We've taken them down. But to be able to fine-tune that, to turn around mm -hmm. and go, actually, during this period, I want to ramp up those alert levels. Or during this period, I want to silence the alerts about this database being down, but I still want to know if the server's down. Right. Which goes into configurability, overall configurability. Mm. You want to be able to, first of all, not alert on a fixed threshold, but on a baseline. I want to know when the system is 10% worse than normal, which is normal for this box on a Tuesday in May, not 
some fixed number, yeah. and then also be able to say things like, I only want to know when this condition has persisted for X number of minutes in combination with this other thing, which gets into, again, the original thing is if you just turn on the default thing, you know, like, oh, that's not a best practice, yeah. it's just an example. You're expected, and you should expect yourself, to put some real thought into when can I take meaningful action on this. I've been guilty of that, the default, just... Oh, this is how it's set, configured, and, and uh, some of that comes down to education on the product too, though, being able to know some of the features and how you can customize it. Well, like if there's a button, it'll do automatic thresholding, and you've never noticed it before, and so you spend all, you spend days in there configuring thresholds to try to kind of quash the logging, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, oh it'll figure out Monday morning when everyone's synchronizing out. Look, great. Yeah, so one of the things that comes to mind listening to you guys about this is um, why don't we have sort of an alerting mechanism that's not email and not Slack and has the ability to do actions? Why don't we have, like, why isn't there a push application on iOS or something that would let you, you know, push alerts and then say, yes, no, if, maybe. If alerts, yeah, then that. Die. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, if this, then that. I, I think lots of tools have that, you know, without naming specific vendors. I think there's, you know, tools that have everything from, you know, hey, the website isn't doing well. First thing you do is clear is reset the application pool. And after 10 minutes, if that's not true, reset IIS. And if that's not true, then reboot the server and then go send a ticket. And yeah. I'll say ticket, not email. Yeah. And well, I'm not necessarily talking even about, um, like, AI or back-end mm -hmm. stuff. Basically, how come the alert's not smarter? The alert itself isn't smarter. How come it doesn't give me a choice or give me an opportunity to do something right there, to push a button and say, well, yes, well, do I, something? Well, there's sort of twofold, right? There are, there are uh, products that are, that are beginning to do that, right, that will actually offer recommendations. For example, if it's looking at data and says, hey, here's something you might want to do, and by the way, here's, the, here's how you might want to remediate it. Here's where you maybe want to move that resource or make that change. But then the other one is, Starting to get people to, and I know, I'm going to go back to my favorite recently, which is logging, but like there are, if, if what people really want is event flows, they don't even want alerts, right? They just want to actually be able to look at data that's based, that's actually kind of real-time data that meets a specific criteria, maybe exposing that so that you're not even starting with the alert in the first place. Uh, actually, Stephen, here's a question for you. Do you think it's that... It's it definitely uh, uh, products could be smarter about generating alerts and how to what they should do in the first place. But do you think a lot of it is just people are afraid to take that last step of automatic action? That, oh. that, 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 that the, the barrier in a lot of ways is human. It's like, yeah, the alert can do that, but I don't trust it or I can't do after action follow up or to make sure that nothing terrible happened as a result of, result of it. I definitely think so, especially if yeah. the action is something dramatic like reboot the system. I think people are terrified of saying, you know, if, you know, threshold of this, you know, reset this thing. Uh, nobody wants to be in a situation like that because we've all experienced the, the negative of that where things go bad, right? I mean, yeah, I would, agree. Are, I would agree with you on that one. Yeah. Yeah, like, like uh, if you see this MAC address on this port, then just down the port, but oops, that's cascaded up to the trunk port. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And it's the same reason that people hate spanning tree and all these other. Mm -hmm. um, things that do things that you didn't maybe ask them to do. Automation, I think, in the past has been a, a pretty scary thing for a lot of sort of dyed-in-the-wool regular IT folks, but I think that with the rise of all sorts of programmability from you know Python in the networking space to just the whole DevOps mentality, I think people are, become, are coming to terms with their fear and sometimes unreasonable fear of automation. And I think that, that you'll see more uh, embracing of the things that can be done automatically. I think also, especially with the DevOps culture, people realize that with load balancing and failover and spinning up containers, the, the um, risk is much lower, and they know how to mitigate the risk by using some of those techniques. Or, or, encap or, or encapsulate their, their human knowledge <clears throat> into code that then is actionable automatically. Yeah, that's a real interesting point. Like with DevOps and SDN and things like that, you're talking about um, automation and does automation spell the end of the flood of alerts? Yeah, but what happens if you're not involved in a devops -y culture in your organization, right, where you may be starting into that, but the whole organization isn't, you're not going to have that same mindset. Certainly and that, that's going to be a problem to overcome. You know, it's a, it's a cultural question about getting people comfortable with you know, in, in this topic, getting the alerts better. And I think that when you say, hey, would you like to not be woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning four times a week? Here's our, way, here's our path there. People will be very happy to get their sleep back, and they will, they will happily adopt 
habits that will allow them to do that. Well, the whole automation argument is something that IT pros need to take a leaf out of the software development books, though, right? Because there are so many of the little tasks and things that we do that we can automate as a process, and it's something that IT pros are so used to having the control. Like, I want to be the one that restarts the service so that I can watch it come back mm -hmm. up. And so, um, you know, we're starting to see that with things like PowerShell to be able to script things from an IT pro perspective and, and automate some of what we do. But we're not so good at applying that to when things are in a crisis and we actually need to do our troubleshooting. We've, we've still got this hang up about doing it manually. Do you think that's part of the reason that the conversation around SRE seems to resonate more than just throwing out the word DevOps and expecting people to sort of think of that as a developer? More sort of that applied automation within ops, not this alien technology or approach that's being brought in by the dev team? Yeah, absolutely, because a lot of IT pros still see DevOps as software developers wanting to put changes into my system more frequently with less testing. Be really, be, <laughs> and, and, and you might even say DevOps is a dumpster fire, <laughs> which was a topic of a former <laughs> podcast here, yes. Indeed. From an IT perspective, uh, IT pro perspective. Yeah. So. Yeah, so, um, well, uh, on that note, I, I don't know that we have an answer here, but we can, I think, definitively say that, uh, that your monitoring and alerts sucks, right? Um, or, or alerts can be incredibly stupid. Yes, alerts can be incredibly stupid. So thank you guys very much for joining us for the uh, on-premise IT Roundtable podcast from Gestalt IT. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, please check us out. Uh, you can find us at gestaltit.com. You can also find us on YouTube. Uh, just search for Gestalt IT or search for on-premise IT Roundtable podcast. And you can find us on your favorite podcast application. So please subscribe. Thanks for listening. <laughs>